إن الحمد لله ونحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا وما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters, wherever you are around the globe at this present time, I greet you with the greetings of the believers. Assalam. Peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi barakatuh. Peace be upon you and the mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I first and foremost ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering and to accept it as an hour that is solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow it to be an hour in which we can grow together. An hour in which we can recharge our hearts from the trials and tribulations that have afflicted us from throughout the week. My dear brothers and sisters, how much do you really know about our way of life Islam? How much do any of us know? Most of us went through 12 years of schooling and not once was the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. Many of us continued for another six years after that or four years and by the end of it still we do not even know how to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the glorious of his beautiful names and attributes is Al-Alim, Al-Hakim. Al-Alim, the all-knowing. Al-Hakim, the all-wise. The knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is infinite. And his wisdom is infinite. His knowledge is so much that the furthest star that is being born in the furthest part of the universe, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of it. He has knowledge of the gases that are making it up, and He has knowledge of it being born before it is even being born. And from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the deepest, the deepest creature that is living even under the sand in the deepest depths of the sea. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his knowledge, he knows the makeup, he knows what it is doing, and he knows how it is doing it before it even does it. And from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the DNA that is in our bodies. The blood that runs through our veins and of course the secrets that are in our hearts. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. And even if we were to use the oceans as ink to write the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to write the knowledge, to write down the knowledge, that it would never be enough. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Qur'an, قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ الْبَحْرُ مِدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي لَنَفِدَ الْبَحْرُ قَبْلَ أَن تَنْفَدَ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي وَلَوْ جِئْنَا بِمِثْلِهِ مَدَدًا 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, say that if, we, if the seas were ink for writing, for writing the words of my Lord, the knowledge of my Lord, that the sea would become exhausted before the knowledge of my Lord was exhausted. Even if we were to bring another sea the same as it, even if we had two oceans, the size of the oceans on this watery planet of ours, that the water, and we used it for ink, that it would never ever be enough to write the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to write the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Alim, the All-Knowing. And yet, and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered every believer, every believer on this earth to seek knowledge. An order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, طلب العلم فريدة على كل مسلم. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that seeking knowledge is compulsory upon every Muslim. Every single Muslim in this world seeking knowledge is compulsory upon him. Why? Because without knowledge, we cannot know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And without knowledge, we cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that He deserves to be worshipped. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, intention is not enough. That you make intention to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, this is asked, but it is not enough that you must worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this intention and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that he has taught us to worship. The way that he taught our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the believer is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon knowledge. And it is those who have knowledge those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with knowledge are those who really worship Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ إِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that only those fear Allah among my servants who have knowledge. Knowledge leads to fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who take knowledge seriously, those who seek knowledge not for fame, not for money, but they seek knowledge to bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who do that are those who are loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of their efforts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises their status in this world and the next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, يَرْفَعَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that He will raise the status of those amongst you who believe and those who have attempted ilm, attempted knowledge, that He will raise them more levels, raise them higher in status. Because ilm, knowledge, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the possessor of all knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves knowledge. And He loves those who have attained knowledge. It is said in the hadith of Abu Darda. Abu Darda was in Damascus, in Damishq, Syria now. And Abu Darda was there. And a man came from Medina to Abu Darda to visit Abu, Abu Darda. And Abu Darda said to the man, what has brought you here? From Medina, 1,000 miles between. 
and he said that I heard that you were relating, that you were narrating a hadith on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Darda said to him, did you come for anything else? He said, no, I came for this hadith. Abu Darda said to him, did you come for any business? Do you have any business here? Any trade? He said, no. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I came to you to get this hadith. Abu Darda then looked at him and said, that I heard the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, that whoever pursues, whoever pursues a path that leads to knowledge, that Allah will pursue a path from that path to paradise. And the angels will rest their wings upon the student of knowledge. And every creature that is in the heavens and the earth will make repentance, will ask for forgiveness for the student of knowledge, even the fish in the sea. For the student of knowledge, the likeliness of the student of knowledge is like that of the moon over the stars. And the students of knowledge do not inherit dirhams, or dinars, money, but they inherit knowledge. And whoever takes it has taken something that is great, something adheem. Seeking knowledge, my brothers and sisters. The Prophet wasallam said, Men yurid Allahu bihi khayran, the Prophet وسلم, said, Whoever wishes, whoever Allah wishes for him good, that he will give him an understanding of the religion. An understanding, not just that he memorizes things and then, and then blurts them out, but no, that Allah will give him understanding of this deen understanding of this way of life and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed for us that those who seek knowledge that they will be raised in status and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes for them good in this world and in the next and of those great scholars the great ulama of Islam the best examples of, the, of seeking knowledge are those, apart from the Sahaba, are the four Imams. Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, and Imam Hanbal, Ahmed bin Hanbal. The four great Imams that now most people follow their, their way, their madhab, their school of thought. And if we take a look at those four Imams, we see that they were all students of each other. Imam Malik was the Imam of Medina, of the, the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the Mufti of Medina. And Imam Abu Hanifa was the Mufti in Iraq. In Iraq. And Imam Shafi'i, Rahimahullah, or Rahimahum Allah, Imam Shafi went and first he studied in Mecca and studied as a youth and then went to the great scholar in Medina, to Imam Malik, and became a student of Imam Malik. After spending many years with Imam Malik, Imam Shafi then went to Yemen and learnt more about language, Arabic language. Then from Yemen, he went to Iraq and learned from the students of Abu Hanifa because Abu Hanifa had now passed away. And after that, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal was a student of Imam Shafi. But Imam Shafi, when he was a student of Imam Malik in Medina, when he was a young boy, he turned up one day to the class and Imam Shafi, what we need to understand is that he was a poor boy. 
He was of those who did not have much money. Sometimes he would use papers from the ground of other peoples or bits of wood or anything that he could write on. And one day Imam Shafi was in the class with Imam Malik. And Imam Malik was a very serious man. In fact, he didn't stand for any nonsense. And Imam Malik one day was teaching the class and Imam Shafi was doing this with his hand. With his finger and his hand. And Imam Malik looked at him and was, he was offended. So after the class, Imam Malik went over to him and he said, you know, Salaamu Alaikum. And he said that this is Qillat al-Adab. This is very bad manners that you are doing, playing with your hands during my class, boy. Because Imam Shafi was a young boy. And he was doing like this. Imam Shafi looked at Imam Malik and he said, I'm sorry, he said, but Wallah al I was not playing with my hands. And if you wish for me to repeat your dars, to repeat the lesson that you gave, that I will do it right now. And he did. He told the whole lesson to Imam Malik that he had memorized it by writing with his finger because he had no pen and no paper. After that, Imam Malik took Imam Shafi, who was a young boy, and placed him on top of his camel and then walked with him to his house and gave him some food and ate with him. And Imam Shafi became the best student of Imam Malik. This is the seeking of knowledge, my brothers and sisters. The importance and the efforts that were put in. That there is not a seeker of knowledge except that he suffers in the path and that he is in jihad fi sabilillah. Just as the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever leaves his house in search of knowledge that he is in jihad until he returns. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll, we'll, we'll go to a short break and we'll return just after this verse of the Qur'an and this short break, inshallah ta'ala. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back, my dear brothers and sisters, to Living Hearts. And today, brothers and sisters, we're talking about the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking that knowledge. Seeking the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we look at the history of Islam and the history of man, we find many great seekers of knowledge throughout the life. But one of the great seekers of knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about in the Qur'an was the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. The Prophet Musa, if we take a look at his life alayhi salam, he grew up in the house of Fir'aun. So he would have learnt the, the knowledge of the pharaohs, of the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians. And if we look at the same time, he grew up in the house of his mother who was from Bani Israel, from the tribe of Israel. So he would have learnt about Allah and about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Musa, when he reached the age and he became a prophet, then he learnt the knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he had direct contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, direct speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Musa alayhi salam thought at that time that he was the most knowledgeable person on the earth. That there was no one more knowledgeable than Musa alayhi salam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach Musa a lesson and all of us a lesson. That no matter how much knowledge we have, there will always be someone who has more knowledge than us. So, the, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam or informed Musa that there is someone, Musa, that is more knowledgeable than you on this earth. Musa, automatically, where is he? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him that he was at where the two seas meet. And immediately Musa, Musa alayhi salam 
took one of his students and headed for that place. A seeker of knowledge. That there is someone that knows more than Musa on this earth. Someone that knows more than me. I want to seek his knowledge. I want his knowledge. So Musa alayhi salam took off and he said that he will, that he will go until he reaches the two seas or until a, a hukba, yani, which means around 70 to 80 years go by. That he was willing to go traveling for that knowledge, seeking for that knowledge up to 70 to 80 years or a long period of time. So Musa alayhi salam left with his companion and they traveled far away. And when they finally reached the place, the companion let, was, they were resting on the rocks. And as they arose, the fish that they had brought with them had escaped and gone into the water and swam away in a very strange manner. And that was the sign that Musa alayhi salam knew that now this is, we have reached the place. We have reached the place where we will find this slave of Allah, who Allah has given great knowledge. And they did. They found the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Khudr. Al-Khudr. And Khudr, when Musa alayhi salam met Khudr, alayhi salam, the first thing that he did was ask him that can I follow you so that I can learn some of the knowledge that Allah has given you. But Khudr replied that you will not be able to be patient. You will not be able to be patient. But Musa alayhi salam said that I promise you that I promise you that I will not I will not let you down. And then Khudr allowed him to go with him. So they came to a boat, a ship. And they came upon the ship. And the very first lesson that Khudr taught Musa was that he put a hole in the ship. And Musa alayhi salam now said that this is something that you have done that is a, a bad thing. But Khudr told him, told Musa alayhi salam that I told you that you would not be able to be patient. But Musa, he said, do not, do not take me for, or do not blame me for that in which I have forgotten. Or that in which I have made a mistake. So Khudr allowed him to come with him further. And the further they traveled, the more events happened. Until they came to an event in which they came to a small village. And in that village were some people who were stingy. And a house that they came to where there was a, a wall. And that wall was falling down. And because it was falling down, those who were building the wall, those who had the wall, wanted to sell it. And Musa and Khudr came to this, to this house in which they refused to give them any food. Refused to give them anything. But Khudr, alayhi salam, then began to build the wall for them. And he built the wall back perfectly so that they did not have to sell it. Musa strangely after that said to Khudr that if you wished you could take from them some money because they didn't feed us in the first place that you could take from them some money but Khudr he told Musa I told you that you would not be able to be patient with me. You would not be able to be patient. And Musa remembered and he said that do not, do not be severe against me for that in which I have forgotten. But if I say one more thing, that that's it. Just give me one more chance. If I say one more thing, then I will go on my way. So Khudr allowed Musa to travel with him more and more. Until they came to a young boy. And when they reached this young boy, Khudr took him and killed him. This now, for Musa, this was too much. Now he said, you have killed this boy. You have killed a nafs and zakiyah, a, a young 
innocent boy you have killed now. And Khura said, that's it. That's it. This is where you and I, we leave. That I told you would not be able to understand what I am saying. And I will now tell you, I will now tell you the explanation of what happened. So that Musa was listening. And Khudr said to Musa that the first was a ship. And this ship, there was a king, a very violent king that was taking all the ships, all the good ships of people, all those ships that were working. And when Khudr put a hole in the ship that it sunk a little bit so that the king would not take it. This was the first mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the first wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, that he taught Khudr. Then came the village in which they, were, they had the wall that was falling down that they wanted to sell until Khudr alayhi salam rebuilt the wall and built the wall and he said that the reason he did this was because underneath that wall was a treasure that the father had left the two sons and that if they had have sold that wall that they would have lost their treasure and then Khudr told him about the boy that the boy who he had killed was a boy who was destined for kufr his parents were too Righteous parents believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the boy was a boy because Allah knows the qadr. Allah knows what is going to happen with that boy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that that boy would be killed so that he does not lead his parents astray to kufr, to disbelief. And it was a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah replaced the boy with that in which was better, in a daughter who was better and closer to them in manners. For the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my brothers and sisters, teaches us everything. And these were lessons that were taught to the greatest seeker of knowledge, our Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And a lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us in the Quran, so that we may learn that not everything that we see on the, on the open, is exactly as it is. That the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deep and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inf infinite. And some of the seekers of knowledge that has came to us in today, we're talking about seeking knowledge and something that happened in the last half of the last century was something that science improved and people began to uh, come closer to science and listening to scientists and experiments were made and things were proved and because of that many people left the Bible many people left the, the, the religion of Christianity because the book that they followed did not agree with science and one of those people was a man by the name of Maurice Bucal Maurice Bucal was a man, and you'll see him in the picture right now. Maurice Bucal was a man who was brought up in a Christian school, and he had a lot of questions. Until he reached the age of 50. When he reached the age of 50, he began to, re to learn about the Quran. And then he was placed in charge. We're talking about a great physician. He was a great physician, so much that he was placed in charge of working on Fir'aun, the Fir'aun that they found in Egypt, in the tombs. And he was the, the physician who was placed in charge. That's how much they trusted him in France. He was a Frenchman. He had reached the top of his field. And then, once he had worked on Fir'aun, it was there where he saw the miracle. He saw the miracle that Fir'aun had in fact drowned. He was doing the autopsy on finding how, how did this mummy die 
And when he saw that it had been uh, drowned, that the cause of death was drowning, that he began to think about it and think because he was a Christian when he was young. But he thought that there was no way that things were preserved. How could they preserve? No other mummies were preserved as well as this one. All of the mummies were not preserved except for this mummy that was in perfect condition. Until Maurice Bukal went to the Quran and he found the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, that, Allah, that Allah will now preserve Fir'aun so that he will be a sign for those who follow. So that he will be a sign for those who follow to see. And this made Maurice Bukal to be of those who now believed that the Quran was the word of Allah. That it must be the word of Allah. And he began to preach this. And he preached it wherever he could. He preached it, in fact, he wrote a book, the book that you'll see on the screen now. And this book was so famous that it was translated into eight languages. It sold 150,000 copies in the first few months. This is back in the 70s. And this book was known to be of that that was giving victory that was saying the truth about the Qur'an, that the Qur'an is the word of God, the word of the Creator, that there is no way, no way, and he began to study more miracles in the Qur'an until he was certain that there was no way and he accepted Islam. And there are those who are trying to say today that he did not accept Islam, but the fact is that he accepted that there is no God except for Allah and that Muhammad was the messenger of Allah and whoever does that is a believer. At the, around the same time, this caused a revolution. A revolution amongst the people. Amongst not just ordinary people, but the scholars. Maurice Bukal was in fact prevented from working after that. That they hated him so much for what he had did that they prevented him. For 10 years he was not allowed to work in his office in France. So he traveled the world. And this began a revolution amongst the scholars of science. We're not talking about just science teachers here. We're talking about the leaders in their fields of science. And one of the events that took place was the 8th annual medical conference in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh. And one of the sheikhs who had attended that was a great sheikh by the name of, of Abdul Majid Azindani. Abdul Majid, Sheikh Abdul Majid Zindani, or Zindani, is the Sheikh who is known for his miracles of the Quran. He studies the miracles of the Quran. And he went to this, to this meeting, to this conference, and he began to talk to those who were the best in the field. There was Keith Moore. Keith Moore, who was in fact the best in embryology. Even today, if you were to look and study embryology in any university in the world, you would more than likely be studying the book of Keith Moore, who in fact wrote the best book ever written by one person on a medical issue. And let's listen to what Keith Moore has to say. When Keith Moore found out about, about the Qur'an and about the miracles that were in the Qur'an, let's listen to this clip. In the 1940s, uh, Professor Streeter of the Carnegie Institute of Embryology in Washington, D.C., proposed a system for classifying the stages of human development. His system arranged human embryos in 23 numbered sta stages based on their difference, differences in appearance. The Carnegie system of classification was used around the world until the 1970s when a more refined system was proposed by Dr. Ronan O'Reilly of the Carnegie Institute of Embryology, now in San Diego, California. Intensive studies of the Quran and Hadith in the last four years have revealed a system for classifying human embryos that is amazing since it was recorded in the seventh century AD. Although Aristotle, the founder of the science of embryology, 
realized that chick embryos developed in stages from his studies of hen's eggs in the fourth century BC. He did not give any details about these stages. As far as it is known from the history of embryology, little was known about the staging and classification of human embryos until the 20th century. For this reason, the descriptions of the human embryo in the Quran cannot be based on scientific knowledge in the 7th, 7th century. The only reasonable conclusion is that these descriptions were revealed to Muhammad from God. He could not have known such details because he was an illiterate man with absolute, absolutely no scientific training. The stages of embryonic and fetal development mentioned in the Quran should be used when teaching Muslim students because they are in accordance with our modern understanding of the development before birth. It will also enable Muslim doctors and nurses to explain human development to their patients using Quranic references. Muhammad could not have known these facts about human development in the 7th century because most of them were not discovered until the 20th century. Muslims and others are justified in concluding that these facts could only have been revealed to Muhammad by the one known who knows all about us, not only about how we developed, but how we live and function. Allahu Akbar. This was Keith Moore, Dr. Keith Moore, the best in his field. He was the dean in the University of, of Toronto in Canada. The dean, he was in charge of all the other teachers. And he came to Islam when he realized, when he, so, he was seeking knowledge. And when the knowledge came to him that was in the Quran, he saw the truth, that the Quran is the truth. And he became a Muslim and he began to call others, other scientists to Islam. And Keith Moore wrote books that are still available today about the embryology and the Quran and about how it is perfect, that there is no difference between the explanation of the Quran and the explanation of science when it comes to embryology. But at the same conference, another scholar of his field from another country. His name is Tejaset Tejasan. Dr. Tejaset Tejasan. I think that's how you say it. And this doctor was a doctor from Thailand who was also in charge of all the teachers in the medical school in Thailand. He was a doctor in uh, anatomy, in anatomy. And when he heard about these miracles in the Quran. Let's look at what he said when he learned these miracles. <laughs> Yeah. 
truth. This was revealed to him as an enlightenment by the one who is knowledgeable creator. This creator must be God or Allah. Therefore, I think this is the time to say La La Illa. There is no God to watch it except Allah. Muhammad Lu the Lu Lula. Muhammad is the center of Allah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. I think it is time now to say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I think that it is time to say now La ilaha illallah, another scientist, but not just a scientist, the leader in his field. Does this not tell you something? Those scientists today there are those who continually coming of that scientist five of his students just in a month converted to Islam underneath him because he told them about these miracles in the Quran and those scholars began and more and more people have come to Islam more and more scientists have come to Islam and scientists without doubt are seekers of knowledge they are those who are seeking answers in this life seeking and trying and learning and asking questions and if you ask the right questions and if you go to the right place then it will lead you to Islam this is the way my brothers and sisters that seeking knowledge brought the best scientists towards Islam there is slander today on upon every single one of those scientists that came to Islam and others they call Maurice Bukhari they say that he has Bukhalism they say that uh, he started a new sect called Bukhalism. But we know from our brothers and from Sheikh Abdul Majid Zindani who met them all that every single one of them came to Islam and every single one of them believed that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through, through science, through learning themselves from what they saw, from the, what they had learned seeking knowledge as a disbeliever most of them were atheists and they were learning seeking knowledge as a disbeliever and then they came to Islam once they heard the truth once the truth was laid down in front of them and there was no more opportunity there was no other explanation except that Allah that there is no God except for Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for brothers and sisters, this is a lesson for every single one of us. That seeking knowledge is something that is very important for our deen, very important for ourselves, that we cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly unless we have the knowledge of prayer. We cannot fast unless we have the knowledge that the fast starts at, at the adhan of Salat al-Fajr. And it finishes at the Adhan of Salatul Maghrib. That if we want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the right way, that we need to seek knowledge wherever it may be. And there will always be those who will seek knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it easy for us today. So much that we can seek knowledge on our television set. We can seek knowledge on our computers. But there will always be those who sacrifice and leave their lands in search of knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowledge of this deen. And whoever they are, they will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Him raising their status in this world and raising their status in the next as long as they did it to benefit themselves. To seek knowledge, my brothers and sisters, we must seek knowledge to benefit ourselves first. That we are ignorant and we want to learn. And after we have attained the knowledge, that we give it back to those, to others. 
give it back to those who have not been so fortunate to be able to travel that we must go to them and spread the message spread the message of Islam and spread the knowledge that we have been given teaching those and alhamdulillah that we have today television sets and computers and everything there is so much knowledge available that none of us have any excuse any excuse not to seek knowledge not to know our deen not to know what it means to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on knowledge and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts and to increase our knowledge increase our knowledge ya Rabb increase our knowledge ya Allah increase us in knowledge and make us of those who are leaving behind leaving behind knowledge that is beneficial to those that follow us ya Allah make us of those who are seekers of knowledge those who are Rabbani'een, those who are working, those who are implementing the knowledge that we, that we learn, Ya Allah. And I ask you, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make us of those who are on the straight path and to not misguide us once we have been guided. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for all of the students of knowledge, wherever they are, all around the world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift their hardships and to make it easy for them and to reunite, reunite them with their families and to reunite them with their health and whatever hardship that they have troubled. Inshallah ta'ala, that's all we have time for today, my brothers and sisters. Until next week, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When you're living in a lawful way, be mindful of what you say, be sincere when you pray. Today could be your last day Bear each other no malice Greed and faith can coexist In the same heart Lord, only you can change your heart We call upon you to do so